special guest to <coughs> Rao Sahab, who has come from all the way from Bangalore. <laughs> Keep a watch, 
and then finally you come to a drug discovery, right? So you will be able to figure out the drugs automatically using the artificial intelligence, right? So what is an AI? And I'll, I'll, I know there, there's a lot of slides. I know you guys, you know, <laughs> suddenly lost interest. I will not talk about too much of the slide. But you understand how an AI works just for your information. Basically, AI is, you would have to use Alexa, for example. There are a lot of, you know, automated cars nowadays, right? So this is all known as art, part of artificial intelligence. And internally, what happens within an artificial intelligence, it has two major parts. One is known as a machine learning. And within that, there is a called something deep learning. So, so, so essentially, machine learning, if you see, it is about learning. For example, how did I know that from my home to airport takes 45 minutes? Simple, because I have traveled, that learning has gone into my brain, and I know today that it takes 45 minutes. So I have learned over a period of time. Similarly, when there is a machine, and you want to make machine learn, like a Google did for me, it did automatically calculate it, the time, right? So this is known as a machine learning, right? I am making machine to learn. And then, machine learning has further progressed something called as a deep learning, right? So deep learning is where we are mimicking your brain. So for example, your brain has neurons. Similarly, we have artificial neurons. So we try to mimic the brain through the artificial neural network. We'll talk about it. But before I move into jumping, a lot of this, you guys are young, I think, previous first year, second year, you would have done a Boyle's experiment, right? Where at a constant pressure, uh, constant temperature, pressure is inverse, inversely proportional to volume, right? I'm now also trying to figure out, right? Something like this, right? Imagine when Boyle was, we didn't know anything about Boyle's law, right? We don't know anything about Boyle's law. But what if I had a reading of pressure and volume, right? So if I have a reading of pressure and volume, and I keep plotting them into a simple x, y, you guys would have used it, right? A simple plot that at this pressure, this is the volume, this pressure, and this is the volume. Simple. Now if I have a good amount of data, next time I get that's a pressure at 13, can I flip that into this particular graph? And can I predict it what is going to be the volume? Isn't it? Simple, right? I am plotting a graph, I have learned this knowledge that normally at this pressure this is going to be volume, at this pressure this is going to be volume and I can fit that into my graph. So even though I did not know what is the 13, I can go into the graph and plot it and then say this is my volume. Even without knowing that pressure is an inversely proportional to volume, I don't know. Right? But what I am doing is I am just simply looking at the data. From the data, I am trying to figure out. For example, if you guys are in the first semester, I am an engineering, so I had a semester, I think you guys would also have the same. If I am scoring well in semester, and I am studying at 8 hours, 9 hours a day, I should be able to predict that I will be doing fairly good in annual, right? No rocket science, correct? So, this is what is doing that we, without looking at any principles, we try to fit the data, we try to analyze the data that where this point is going. Similarly, you see that this um, Very simple sense, right? So, 
Essentially, these are the two problems we will talk. One is the classification problem, another is the regression problem. Classification, then we will classify something, whether somebody will pass or fail, whether somebody's credit history is good or bad, right? Regression is something that you are trying to predict whether that patient will remain how many days in a ICU, for example, right? So that is the number that you are trying to predict. So that is known as a regression problem. So just keep in mind, it's nothing that important. And normally what we did here, if you see, I collected the data like pressure volume. I built a model called as a tenant case. And then finally I am trying to predict it, right? It is like collecting the data that it takes 45 minutes for me to reach and then predicting something that today how much time it is going to take, right? So this is a simple, simple thing in AI you will use everywhere. That you will collect the data, you will do a training and testing. And the training is testing is that first you take entire data and then you take part of that data for training. And once you are predicting something, then you are testing it against the remaining of the data. For example, you took 40 students, 30 students you build your model, like P is equal to B, like this one. And for 13, when it came, I just tried to predict what is going to be the volume, because that is not known to you, right? And then I test whether my model is good or not. So, this is a simple AI terms. Don't need to worry about too much. But just simply move on to the next one. So, typically if you see, uh, it's a pass-through slide, but how AI has been used. So AI is basically used, being used in uh, early detection of diseases. It is also being used uh, tracking a severity of a disease. It is being used for identifying symptoms, diseases, impact of comorbidity, any, and then effective medication, it also tells you based on the symptoms and prior knowledge. And then it's also used about the new drug discovery and as I said about the detection you can do a lot of image processing. For example, by looking at an x-ray or looking at a, uh, you know, uh, MRI scan, I can tell whether that scan is normal or it's an abnormal, right? So there's a lot of areas where AI is actually working. So the first use case, as I promised to you, I will only be limited myself into healthcare, biological and diagnostics. I'm going to tell you that how I treat the symptoms and treatment, right? So guys, in November 2019, when the SARS-CoV-2 virus was discovered, nobody knew anything, what it is, right? We heard in 2020, I remember, that there are some peculiar disease has come in China and, you know, people are severely infected, many people are dying. Now, imagine that virus pandemic is going, and a guy who is just starting his name, Robert, come to a doctor, you guys are future doctor, I believe, they say, hey, I have a shortness of breath and cold, right? Now this is the patient that comes to you. Now for this doctor, he knows that it is it could be normal flu. I mean, this is what he has seen. He has not seen before any COVID reports or anything, right? But then he immediately say, hey, there is another disease going on, which is COVID. And if it is COVID-19, it can become very critical. So what should I do? So obviously now he has to go back and look at the data. Now the problem is when if this doctor wants to see the data, most of the clinical records you would have seen, I was trying to get some records from the Tarpur Medical College and it was so horrible that I stopped looking at it. Because first of all, your writing, doctors, your writing is very difficult to understand. Even if I understand, my computer does not get that, right? So, most of this data is in text, PDF, images that you have taken, the X-rays that you have taken, the MRI stats you have made. How to read this data? Right? It's a very, very difficult problem. So this guy is always, you know, you don't know what to do, right? And sorry for you, this is you guys. So then we something called as a technology called as a text mining, right? And what exactly text mining does, it actually read all your unstructured data. There is your data actually. The data is basically medical records because there may be a lot of patients during that time got admitted into a hospital. You have data in the pub bed, you have data in the wiki and so many things. And then what we do, we call something as a natural language processing, where we try to understand the meaning out of this data. And then, once I understand that data, then I try to get some meaning, some prediction out of it, whether it's going to be a COVID patient or not, or what are the symptoms. So, I will show you some realistic data, basically. So, if you see, this is a, this is a real, real case. And what I say, the 76 year old male with a history of chronic injury, blah, 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 February after diagnosis or so and so, patient presented. So this is all past COVID data. 
Remember, doctor doesn't know whether this patient which has pain has COVID or not. But he was wanted to show that I am treating my patient very well. Maybe he is a COVID infected. So should I look at all the COVID process to see whether his symptoms are really matching to that the previous identified COVID patients, right? So what we call is, we convert this test data to something called as a near identity. For example, if you see male, it is obviously a sex, right? If you see SpO2 92%, most likely it is a biomarker or chemical biomarker, right? If you look at uh, this, this is a virus kind of a thing. And then if you see this one, like a bleed of oxygen, etc., right? So this is most likely uh, either a disease or it's a part of your treatment, right? Something like that. So this is the data. This is the real test case, the, the, the real uh, patient case, right? So what we do in this case is there are two approaches to do text mining. The first approach is, which is an ontology based, and the second approach is, which is the deep learning based. So what happens is in ontology based, there's a lot of artificial intelligence scientists, data scientists, they have created the ontology for, for, for everything. So for example, they have created the on, on, ontology for all clinical, clinical symptoms. They have created an ontology. Ontology is nothing but a dictionary, right? So somebody, over the period of time, through the crowdsourcing, they have collected that words and then they created something called ontology. And this ontology is available everywhere. So you can just simply go to the internet and I have put some slides. Here if you look at um, the bioportal.bioontology.org, if you search this website, you will see a lot of ontologies are also there. So now what I am going to do, I am going to apply this ontology onto my text data to try to get what are these terms, right? So this is one way of doing it. The second way of doing it is via the deep learning based model. So what happens in this particular model? There are experts, data scientists, doctors, researchers who have marked previous cases as okay, this is a disease, this is a treatment, this is a diagnosis, right? So they have marked those words. And based on all previous cases, now your machine learning try to understand if the new case comes, whether it's a disease, whether it's a symptoms, even if those symptoms we have not earlier identified by passing general grammar because you know that word comes before noun for example or after noun right so based on that part of speech it tries to extend that it could be a symptom it tries to predict that this could be a symptom though that symptom is not known before right so today what i'm going to show you i'm just simply going to show you an ontology based that where the people have created already an ontology and if you see this how does it work? I have taken a 30 medical cases for the COVID patients. I extracted the data. I am now going to apply ontology on that. There is something called as a term frequency. So basically once you categorize your text, you try to count those words, like how many those words are, and which those of those words are very important, right? And then you show it in a, some interesting way. I am going to show you in a word account. If I show you what kind of test case what kind of uh, data I had was okay, I can't share the data but so now you see I run that text finding so the first thing is where I was just trying to look what are the symptoms right and this, this, I have run the text mining on the 30 test cases or the 30 patient cases. I don't know anything. I just only know they are the COVID cases. And based on that, it says majority. So the more bold letter, that more that prominent that, that, that disease is. So it's saying that fever was the most prominent one. The pneumonia was the most prominent one. The tough, heart failure, sinusitis, respiratory failure, dyspathia. These are very common symptoms that it is fine, right? So it, first of all, but just by looking the test, it has no idea what a fever is. Just plain data analytics, as I said in the Boyle's law, no idea what is pressure, what is volume, pure based on data. Then I said, okay, what are the possible uh, treatment that in this case could be, right? So uh, this is basically clinical parameters. So it says the clinical parameters that you should look, because now it is running on the clinical ontology is, you should check the body temperature. You should look, look at the oxygen saturation. Remember, I am talking about 2019. Many of you got SpO2 machine much later. But my test data is telling you right away that you should monitor. You should monitor the respiration rate. You should monitor the plaque count. This is very, very critical. Because it would have noticed that the patients from the 30 patient history, which is a pure text data, 
from there, it is able to identify that this is going to be my case impulse. Then if you look at it, what are the comorbidities, comorbidities with that, right? And then you will see also hypertension, influenza, diarrhea, syndrome, cancer. These kind of patients become severely ill when, when you know the COVID impacted them, right? And this is uh, another, like if you see the treatment, so what are the treatment they have been getting? So you might get, you say here all the antiviral drugs, right? Like a biopic here, right? Remdesivir, if you see a little bit deeper into this, right? So this, this was basically the, those are the steroid, for example, if you look at this word, the steroid. So this is the treatment, it is saying that out of those 30 patients history that you gave, this is what, you know, it, it was done. Next thing is when I talk about symptoms is the diagnosis, right? So, now if you look at, so, 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 so the one thing in the diagnosis you can do, now that, that, that patient came, right? First thing you do, you figure out what are the symptoms, then you see whether this particular case is matching to any of those similar cases, because you already have 30 patients' case, cases data. So then what you can do here is, this, this is this particular, uh, if, you, if you see, this, this, this is called as a, uh, you know, cosine similarity. This is another algorithm. So what we do in this case, we create a vector for each of the document, right? So for example, I got 30 cases. So for each of the document, I create a word vector. And vector has your keywords, like symptoms, I was telling treatment. So based on those keywords, it creates a vector. And then it tries to see that the new case that has come, how close that vector is with respect to this, this particular vector, right? So if I go back, this is known as something called, uh, you know, if you see, you, cosine similarity and document plus sign. Right? So what happened it is, if you see it in the pillow, there are 30, 30 cases. And the ones which are very close, so it is showing that this particular case and this particular case is very close. But if you see there is a red mark, I, I, I sure you cannot understand. But this is a cancer case that I put it into the, my data set. So rest remaining are all the COVID cases. There also it is saying that this two case, this two case, this two case are very close. This case is also very close. But this close, this case you see the distance, right? So the more distance it means it is not at all close. Neither it is matching with any other close, this particular thing. So it says what it is doing, it is showing you the case similarity, that which case is similar to another case and it is removing the cases which are not relevant. So for example, this particular case was a cancer case that I added, it was not a COVID case and it simply says that the distance is too, way too high. So all your data set, all other cases are somehow related to each other but this particular case is not related to each other, right? So that way you can figure out if you don't know and you are just a doctor, you don't know it's a new disease you simply run the artificial intelligence and then you are figuring out that whether this particular patient's case is really matching to the diagnosis I am making, right? And the diagnosis in this case, he was first thinking flu, but then now he's like also making sure that the patient does not got a COVID-19, right? So the next thing is about the disease progression, right? So now what? Let's say the COVID test done, the person was fine, fine to be uh, COVID positive, right? So now the most important factor for us, and particularly as a biochemist, uh, biochemist is on my uh, conference, that there are a couple of things. One thing is that how to know whether this patient is very serious, number one, right? I mean, of course you are looking at different parameters, but how to know whether this patient is really serious? What are those chemical parameters? because of which impacting the illness severity, right? So that is very important, right? The second thing is, as a doctor, if the patient is very really critical, you need to know whether that patient will survive or not, right? So you are also trying to predict that what is the possibility of that patient surviving, right? So that is the second prediction that you want to do. The third thing is that if that severity is, the illness or disease is focusing, how much time I have to react to, because you want to try different drugs, I saw, right? You want to try remdesivir, you want to try any other drug, right? So, but you need to know that how much time I have, how much time this patient is going to survive, basically, right? If, so, if I have to do any experiment, I do it before that. So, that is where the comes the disease progression, I have said, and I will just show you, 
In this particular example, if you see, the John got admitted in the ICU, and again this is for you, very happy, just going to read. But this doctor does not know how critical my patient is because it's a new disease, right? He doesn't know much. I can order the clinical test, but which one? Should I go order all the 10,000 biochemical tests which is available today? How I correlate severity with the clinical parameters? I don't know. Even if I get the test, how does it predict that the disease is really severe, right? What is the life expectancy, right? How much time I have to treat and wait, right? So again, he has to go back and his situation is like this again, that he wants to ask all these questions which he does not have any answer. So essentially if you see, there is something called electronic health records. It can be used. Normally if you go into the modern, you know, hospitals, they are maintaining uh, the good data. They are maintaining the data of the patient, they are the, the, the chemical tests that have been performed, the clinical tests that have been performed. So let me look at some of the data, how the data look like. Right? But before that, just a very simple example to explain that what I am going to use here. I am going to use here is called a decision tree, right? So the way I will just explain you that if I know that how many hours you are reading every day and how much you scored in your midterm, I can predict it that how much you are going to score in the final. Right? This, I, I create some sort of a tree which is called as a yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And uh, based on that you can do prediction. So this is something called as a decision tree. This is the algorithm I am going to use to do this kind of a prediction. By the way, this year you can also apply in your day to real life. Many of the girls, you will get a lot of proposals from boys and you can figure out which is the best boy for you based on the parameters, right? So you can predict that. So very similar to that, right? You, you can actually figure out all the parameters as an input parameters and then you are trying to predict that what you want to achieve. So basically in the decision phase 3, there are two algorithms. One I am going to use called as a random forest. Another I am going to use as a gradient boost predictor. Right? So these are the two algorithms. And what happens in, in the random forest, it is again a tree based algorithm. But we choose multiple trees here. So because the more number of parameters you are going to have, for example if you are selecting a boy and then you have a parameter like salary, height, you know, weight, intelligence, which is probably the least. And then all other is there, right? So you may have hundreds of such parameters. So you might have to end up creating a lot of decision trees, right? So this, because this is a collection of trees, we call it as a random forest. And other is the gradient boost uh, um, algorithm, where actually there is a lot, there is a learning that you learn from the first tree. That learning you going to pass to the second tree. So that is, a, you don't have to get too much of deeper. But end of day what happens is, let's say this tree say that this student will pass, this tree say this student will pass, this tree say that this student will fail. I will take a majority weight and saying that this student will be pass. Likewise in this case also. Right? So it's basically based on majority. You have created lot of decision trees. And based on the majority vote, you, know, you are going to predict whether that student will pass or not. So now I do, took again the patient. So I have 400 plus, I think I have 453 patient data in ICU. I have around 37 physical and biochemical parameters. So this is the test of those patients that was done. And what I am going to predict here is the mortality. Whether that person, person, patient is going to live or he might die also, right? So I am going to predict that and that will tell me about the severity. So how should I do that first, right? So if you look at, if you look at the data that I have collected, and this is all real time data. I can't show you here for some reason, but the data is where I have parameters collected like sex, blood pressure, SpO2, DM, STN, CBD, WBC, absolute neutral, HGT, FCT, PNT, MCT, MCH, MCSC, you know, PT, PTT, all of these are the clinical tests, right? So we have 37. And when I run my random forest algorithm, so it started giving you that which is the most important and the critical parameter by just looking at the data. It does not know what an SPO2 means, right? But by looking at this data, it started predicting you that how critical or how important that data is for the disease, uh, disease severity, right? So for example, this was very clear that you have an SPO2 which is the most one important one. We all know this. This is also my algorithm is predicting. 
But the next couple of things which I don't know, probably you researchers and doctors should look at it. It says D U N, right? I think this is Julia, Julia Nigeria, right? So this is something it is saying it works for the patients who got from normal to severe. Their D U N can continuously increase. So this is the next parameter it is saying. Then it is also saying that age is a very important factor. It is also saying that L D H that is very important. And then it is also saying about INR somewhere, so which is I, I read on Twitter, I don't know this comes much, so I read INR was mostly with respect to a coagulation, right? And you guys would have heard in the COVID diseases, a lot of patients got coagulation because of that, uh, you know, uh, the heart attack and things like that happened, right? So it is clearly predicting the lower being the highest importance and as soon as you go up, you know, the importance gets very really less. So for example, sex, there was no impact on the sex. It was same for male and female, right? So there was no such impact. Similarly, if you see the BP, so BP does not really change a lot between the COVID patient, right? So this all things that you see, so I have done two algorithms, one in random forest and another the gradient boost algorithm. To see whether the data that I am really preparing or the data that I am extracting, whether this is really making any impact or not, right? So this is not exactly I try to say that SPO2, BUN, A, LDH, absolute neutral, INR has shown the major impacts. But there was no impact on sex, STM, AIT, CBD, etc. I think this is uh, your uh, liver uh, enzyme, right? And then other parameters have medium to less impact. So this is something you know, I am a data scientist, I am not a doctor. And what I am trying to do, I am just simply running these algorithms, which is a random forest in the gradient boost algorithm. And based on that, I am telling you that how severe this your conditions is going to be, right? The guys who have uh, maximum casualties, they saw, you know, these parameters significantly impacted, right? Okay, then I'm going to predict the mortality, right? So again, I have the same patients. I have 400 patients. Out of that, I split the data into two. 300 patients I use for training and 100 patients I used to test that and now I am going to predict whether that patient is going to be live or not right and the data is about 450 uh, patient data let me see if, uh, if I click here it opens no it does not ok but so if you see the results again on the prediction when I used So what it is saying? So this is actual and this is so, okay. Sorry, this this is actual and then this is predicted, right? So this is actual. Zero means uh, dead, one means live, right? So you see the data. So what data is saying? It is telling you how many times it is corrected correctly. So zero is corrected correct at 32 times. Means 32 times that patient actually they be predicted and not that the patient will die and he actually died, right? So that's mean we correctly classified around 110 times and 38 times we classified it not so correct. So that's mean 148 total cases. Out of 148, 110 times I was correct when I predicted about the patient whether that patient is going to be alive or the patient is going to be died. We were not correct in 38 times. That's mean our accuracy was around 75% accuracy by which I was able to predict whether that patient is going to survive or not, right? So this is what we used uh, as part of, uh, you know, the machine learning and author. And I explained you earlier, if you recall, whether it's a classification problem or it's a regression problem. I'm saying whether the patient will die or patient will live, right? Is it classification problem or is it a regression problem? If you remember, recall. So it's a classification problem, it's a class. Die or live, good or bad, fail or pass, right? So, so this is basically I'm trying to classify that particular problem whether that patient is going to live or die, or he's going to be discharged or he's going to be diseased, right? So I was able to figure out 75 percent I was very accurate by running on that just the data, right? And this is all on the real COVID patients. This is all original work, right? It's not taken on the uh, uh, from some other study, right? So this is a our uh, uh, you know, algorithm that we have run. The 
The next is uh, how many days that patient is going to spend in the ICU. Again, the same data that I have. And then I am going to apply again the same algorithm that you see, the random forest and XGP model. So this is a modern detail. I am sure you guys are not that much interested. But yeah, if somebody is interested, you can cut me offline. I will tell you that how actually I have created this model internally. You don't have to worry too much. So this is now my prediction shows. So the so the green ones that you see, that is the actually actual value. And the, and, the, and the orange one, it is a predicted one, right? So many times you see here, right, where you see the green and, and red is in a, in a very good uh, alignment, that's when you are right. But very, many times you are not so good. You see here you are seeing actual value this, but predicted is down, right? So he's saying that patient will actually live longer than what we predicted. Similarly here patient live longer than what we predicted. But many times it is trying to capture the flow. So if you see both graphs are looking okay going hand in hand. But that means the model is not fitting very well because of the root mean square error that we are getting. So this is root mean square error is basically the predicted minus actual square. Uh, you know and then take a root and divide by the number of uh, samples that you have. So this is a major of, of calculating whether my model is predicting that good or not. So I clearly said that our model is not fitting very well because two, two reasons. One is that the data itself was not sufficient. So normally in order to really generalize this, 400 patient data is very less. You should have at least 5000 patient data so that you can do a regression problem where you are going to predict a number. This is a regression problem because I am going to tell you that how many days, it is not good, bad or did die. I am saying going to, I am telling how many days this patient is going to, uh, you know, stay or live in the, in the ICU, right? So many times, you know, you need to have a good amount of data. And uh, I didn't get a good results here because you see there are some gaps here if you see, right? So this is a gap. Actually, both the graphs should have gone hand in hand, right? So together if they would have drawn the actual and predicted, then you would have seen a good result. And then the next approach that we applied was basically we got it as a deep learning model. So, so if you remember, uh, how a neuron, a brain neuron works, right? So you have dendrites. So basically dendrites are like inputs. You give a lot of electrical parameters to it. And then finally an exon exit, you know, exhibit from here. And then exon goes to another, you know, exon and another dendrite, you know, uh, the dendrites, right? And then a constant network. Right? This is how typically your brain work, right? I'm not an expert, so can't tell you much there, I think you guys know. But similarly, we also have an artificial neurons. So uh, for us, your dendrites is nothing but the input. And the output is the actual electrical signal which has been passed. And the hidden layers are the one which is basically, you know, trying to do some formula calculation. So for example, the previous example when I gave you, the SpO2. So this could be SpO2, you know, BUN, A, whatever factor, this could be your input. And then I apply different different weights and these guys later layers calculate those weights and based on that works they check whether they are mapping to output whether with that particular weight the disease was severe or less severe or more severe or whatever, right? So it keep calculating that based on applying different different weights here. So this is how your brain works. This is exactly how an artificial intelligence works, right? So we tried with this, we tried to run this model and uh, uh, you know we call it as an artificial neural network model where I used info, input layer as in my biomarkers so you remember all 37 parameters with SPU, SPU to bar and then we have a hidden layer and then there was an output interval we were going to do which is a death interval and this is what we have plotted right so here also if you see that accuracy is not very good because I have been in the error here between minus 10 to 10 right normally the good prediction is that you should be within 1% one, 1 so as long as you are between minus 1 to 1, that's when you are doing a good prediction. But this model is a better than the previous model because if you see the most of the things are at this region where your actual and predicted was almost same in this region. Of course, there are many outliers. So this is where your, you know, the deep learning models works, which is again a next level of the machine learning. So you have, as I said, I started with text mining. I said now you have to go, you know, machine learning and then I, I got into the deep learning and then I tried to see the deep learning model. I think my last thing is I just wanted to touch upon was the drug discovery. 
So, <coughs> that how this uh, drug discovery happens, right? So today, I'm not sure if you guys have studied any time, but if you normally want to bring a normal drug into the market, the typical money that you spend to bring a new drug is around $3 billion. And roughly takes, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, 8 to 10 years before you can get a good drug in the market. The problem you know that there are already 10 to the power 60 types of molecule today which can act like a drug. So you don't know which molecule to attempt, which molecule is going to grow. For example, in case of COVID, and I will explain. Then, what we have today, by the way, is a, something called as a drug database, where you have all these molecules. But then, even if you figure out that I have a molecule which can act like a drug, that means you have to search now that in that database, in terms of the stereochemistry of this molecule, and really see in that database whether this molecule that you have figured out which has a good affinity to the target molecule, whether that molecule exists here or not. So if I explain you with an example. So how the COVID works, right? How the SARS-CoV-2 mechanism is. So basically if you look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it has got something called as an spike protein, S protein, right? I mean there are many other proteins which acts in the, this one, but the S protein was the one which was very, very common that was found in the virus, right? So this virus has this protein called a spike protein and in the humans, which we are, we, we had a host called as a receptor called ACE2, ACE2 receptor, right? And what happens in case of a COVID that this virus actually gets attached to this ACE2 receptor and after attaching it creates another big protein, right? And in this protein, you have one more element, a molecule called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP, right? Now this RDRP, if you see, this particular molecule, what it does is like a Xerox machine. You would have guys have worked on the Xerox machines, right? So it takes a copy and then it tries to produce a copy. So it takes a virus copy and then tries to produce the Xerox copy of that virus. So that is what the work of this uh, you know, uh, RDRP is. So now, what happens is, if I have a drug here, which is very close to the RNA of this particular virus, and if I provide that drug into the, to, to, to this guy, for example, RDRP, in a layman terms, RDRP will get confused. Whether I need to choose, when I am creating a copy, whether I need to choose the RNA from the virus, which is A class normally, or should I take the copy which I am getting it from this molecule? Because both molecules look very simple and it will get confused. So what it will do if it gets confused, if it took the drugs molecule, then the RNA sequencing will not be complete, right? And that's where you will break the chain of the COVID, right? So you will break the cycle. So this is, there could be many more mechanisms, but I am just talking about in the drug discovery, one simple mechanism, right here, where you could actually create a copy of very similar RNA and confuse this guy. And if this guy got confused with the molecule that it is getting from externally, versus the molecule of the virus, it will not be able to create the right RNA sequence and uh, you know the cycle will stop, right? So the virus will not spread further, not replicate further. So how machine learning will help here? I mean, is this possible first of all to look at all the 10 to power 60 molecules? Do you think it's going to work? All the patterns, right? Very difficult. Even visual inspection, you go to the different databases, try to figure it out. It's very difficult. The, the best companies that I know, they can in a day do a 10 to the power 10 visual inspection in a day, which is the maximum possible in today's world, right? So that's where again machine learning comes and play, you have to grow. And the artificial intelligence, and I say machine learning, artificial intelligence, I said, you have an artificial intelligence which has machine learning and which has a deep learning in common. Right, so AI is a combination of these two. So how we do a new drug discovery? So the good thing is that we have, there are a lot of uh, material available, we have something called Uniprod database. The Uniprod database URL is here. So what this database ha has, it has got all sort of a proteins. 
which are linked to a disease. So it is a basically a drug bank in the, in, in the not the drug bank, but the protein database, right? protein bank you can say. And based on a lot of comment, a lot of journals that is available, there is already some work done here, if you look, click on this particular line, which is very specifically to Uniprot, Uniprot for the COVID-19 virus. So it will give you all the possible proteins which are involved today in the which protein? Spike protein or that kind of a similar protein which was very much linked to the virus, right? So what I do first, I go to this database, I limit down my search, so it gives me around the result of around 40 proteins where it has seen a lot of activities for that particular disease, for that particular uh, RNA of virus. Then what I do, I extract that from the PDB, which is a protein database, uh, sorry, the so, so this is a target protein which has very specific to unique disease based proteins and all the details of this protein has been stored in something called the PDB. So this is where the database you see. So for example, for this particular protein which is OA15393, you have extract which is 7MEQ, right? This is coming directly from the PDB database. The next thing what I do is I try to create the ligands information from PDB, right? So for this particular molecule or this particular protein, all the ligands information I try to get it again from the PDB information. So if you look at a particular information, it will look like this, right? So it is showing you the difference. So smiles, if you see, this is a chemical representation of any molecule, right? So this is what is very specific to the software or the artificial intelligence folks, right? Because computer does not understand. I mean, the brain can understand the stereochemistry of the molecule, it can figure out such effect. Right? But for computer to act, I have to make it available in a language which computer can really understand. So what I did, I created a smiles out of it. I got it a chemical language, right? And of course, it also calculates some more formula which I will use in my artificial intelligence called the inchai. Then next is that I convert this molecule, this, you know, the smile into a uh, actual molecules. So now you see the same molecules I have got converted them into into the molecules like this. It is showing it right. So this is where we use a machine learning kit, uh, you know, a kit called as an RDK, and that RDK is, is responsible for converting any smiles into a molecules that can be understand. The next thing is how to interpret this particular molecule. So there is something called Marco scaffold. There could be many ways of doing it. So Marco scaffold, what it does. Basically, it breaks this particular molecules into the aromatic rings, into the non-aromatic rings, yeah, right, and all, all the edges, right, how many times per hour? Two minutes, I'm just finished, last, yeah, two minutes. So, I just break this, right, this molecule into aromatic rings, non-aromatic rings, and different things, right, so basis on that, what I do is now, I am going to create a cluster out of it. The same cluster where I am trying to look at in the database and then figure out where this structure exists in the database automatically, right? And once I figure out that which is my common service structure which is available, I simply find a search into a drug bank, for example. So in this case, I have used a drug bank called go.drugbank.com. This is a free. So once this service structure, once you have normalized this molecule and created a service structure, then you can actually figure out the service structure. Now you can actually go and by machine learning you can search into uh, this particular databases. So this is the way where you actually able to create a new molecule or drug. By the way, every similar uh, discovery was done by this process, right? So this was one of the process that was used for the every discovery, right? So I think, yeah, I mean, with this, I'm pretty much done. I think I'm almost over time, but uh, are there any questions? The session is now open for questions. Anybody found interesting? Or not so interesting, yeah? So the question is, in the last slide when you were talking about the discovery, you said in the cluster uh, part, your whole uh, network was based on getting the information from protein data, that, that is pretty. Yeah. But there are proteins whose structures are not available. Yes. I agree. No, very good question. So there are more databases. So normally I just for simplify I just show you the PDB, right? But the biggest database is Campbell database, CHEMDL. But Campbell is for 
So, so there are more. So you can still go ahead and figure out uh, at least four more databases are there. Where you can go and then I'll, I'll give you the, the names of those databases. So you are right, this one database is not enough, but there are multiple such databases where you can get the legal information as well as you can get the protein databases information. Right? So this is all you can get it into and I have those names. Thank you. 